The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a religious leader and the other a tax collector. The religious leader standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. The tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humble, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of our Savior. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I'm so glad to preach today because I am the very best at humility. <laughs> Seriously, I am so very good at being humble. I mean, if you want to study how to be humble, just come and hang out with me. I'm amazing at it. I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I'm glad you get the, the joke here. I'm glad you get the irony of all of what I have just said. It's important for us as we read the text this morning and hear the parable that we also get the irony and the humor in what Jesus is doing. Jesus is giving us this parable and it's complex. And in a way, it's a fun and humor filled and ironic trap for us to just step right into. When we feel satisfied that we're not like that guy, the arrogant guy who's bragging and pointing at the tax collector, when we feel so satisfied about that and instead see ourselves as the humble tax collector, then we have fallen into the trap of feeling superior. See how great this is? I have, I have read this and felt that way. At least I'm not like that. Anyone else? No. So we fall right into this trap that Jesus is kind of playfully set for us to pay attention, right? This playful trap. This trap that while playful is also serious because the contempt for others, that kind of superiority and arrogance rips God's people apart and, and rips us apart internally as well. In this text, Jesus is inviting us to search ourselves to find any hidden spot where those sharp little bits of contempt and superiority and arrogance linger within our hearts and souls and minds and put us in danger, in danger of cutting into our relationship with God, into our relationships with each other. This parable is not about how Pharisees are bad and humble tax collectors are good. That's the trap. No, nope. this parable, my friends, is about you and me and how we're going to live. Do we fall into the trap and are we going to stay in the trap as a lifestyle of thinking and behaving as though we have the right and responsibility to judge other human beings as being good or bad? as though we have that right and responsibility. As we heard the parable, we fell into the trap. We did it a little bit. We judged one man's prayer as better than the other. Perhaps, maybe some of you have already learned the lesson and didn't fall into the trap. Bravo. If you feel really good about that, though. <laughs> Do you see how slick this trap is? Ha! Huh. Dina doesn't know that I did not fall into There it is, right? It's so slick. 
such an easy trap for us. We're so good at falling into it, quite frankly. Now, Jesus was thoroughly a faithful, praying Jewish man and possibly a Pharisee himself. There are scholars who think that Jesus could have been a Pharisee. He certainly had Pharisee friends and colleagues. He was as well educated as these scholar leaders. And we know that he knew how to pray out loud in public. Right? Because somebody was paying attention and wrote it down, put it in the Gospels for us. So in this text, Jesus is not teaching us to judge Pharisees, although many have used it that way. Jesus is catching us in a playful trap to help us move away from judging others using this ironic humor. Perhaps so that we can laugh at ourselves a little bit like we have this morning. And as we laugh at ourselves, loosen up a little bit, right? Loosen up at the way we continually fall into this judging trap of judging others and also of judging ourselves. That's part of the trap as well. Now, I want to quote a very esteemed colleague, the Reverend Charles Schaefer, who happens to be here this morning, as he is so many Sunday mornings. I remember early in our relationship when you came to serve here, we were vesting in the hallway on the other side of this wall, and we were talking about judgment and judging others. And you shared with me, Charles, that your wife, of blessed memory, Barbara, had a saying about this that you found useful. And it has served me so well ever since. I want to share it with you. Barbara would say, we are not judges. We are fruit inspectors. So we don't judge whether a person is worthy, whether they are good or bad, evil, whatever. We inspect the fruit of their lives. That's the part we want to hold each other accountable around, rather than passing judgments on the being of that person. In other words, we have neither the right nor the responsibility, thanks be to God, of judgment of another person's heart or motives or worth. God handles all of that. I don't know how, but God handles it. We don't have to worry about it. It can be useful for us, however, to inspect the fruit, to understand if our behavior and the behavior of others in the community, if that behavior produces life-giving results for God's people, for the community. That's where accountability comes in. Judging sounds like now, whether it's spoken aloud or it's silently in, it's better if it's in your head, let's be honest. If it doesn't pass through your lips and come out in words, that's pro and especially if not to the person, it's probably better, or about the person. We do it in our heads, and sometimes we stop ourselves from saying it. The dream is that we don't do it at all, that we switch gears in our head to fruit inspecting, right? Because judging, whether spoken aloud or silently within us, sounds like you always do this because you are a blank person, selfish person, whatever person, right? You fill in the blank, okay? Or you only care about yourself. That's who you are. You don't care about other people. That's a judgment of someone. Those are accusations. Those are condemnations, judgments, and unfortunately, these things come to mind and then slip out our mouths so much more readily than what we might say or think instead as, as fruit inspectors, which is, wow, what just happened was really hard for me. I'm not sure I feel safe right now because this just happened. I feel this way when you do that. And my need is this. My need is to feel safe. I felt mocked, and I needed to know that I trusted you, so I don't feel safe right now. Right? To inspect the fruit, to notice what's happening for you in the moment. Brene Brown, who many of you have read or heard on a podcast or TED Talk, she has a way of explaining the difference between guilt and shame that I think is really related. So shame is when you feel very, very small as though you are bad. Shame is, I am bad. I'm a bad person. 
Guilt is very different. Guilt is, I have done something now. My behavior has not been so good. That's different than the worth, right? You see the difference between shame and guilt? And we do it to each other, not just ourselves, right? Fruit inspectors are more in the world of guilt rather than shame, which is so dangerous. Now, if I had a magic wand, and you all know that I do not, but if I did, I would wave it right now and turn us all immediately into fruit inspectors, into these emotionally intelligent Jesus followers who clearly communicate feelings and needs to one another, no trouble at all. Wouldn't that be great? Most of us were not taught how to do those things. And so we settle instead for arrogance, for judgment, for feeling superior. Even though our Christian faith, our Jesus, urges us to learn a new and better and yes, harder way. So here's an idea for us. What if, what if we all, everybody here, committed to some incremental growth in this area? What if we committed to incremental growth in learning to slowly and steadily grow our hearts and our minds and our mouths to move away from this slippery trap of judging ourselves and one another, leaving instead some sort of spaciousness within us spaciousness for love and wisdom and guidance to really move us into a kind of loving and mutually beneficial relationship, the kind we long for. Incremental growth is a key strategy for the faith journey. It took me several weeks this past summer, incrementally, to grow into a person who could rest <laughs> and receive the blessing of renewal on my sabbatical. It took days and weeks to incrementally shed and be ready to rest. I couldn't do it in one day. It would have been nice if I could. There was just too much to unlearn, to release. This is also true of my relationship with supporting the ministries of a congregation. Over time, I have incrementally increased what I give, percentage-wise, to the congregation in which I live and serve. I first gave a pledge when we were at the Cathedral of the Incarnation about 25 years ago. The first pledge I ever made was about 1% of my salary. That was my first pledge. And over time, I've incrementally been able to increase that to a percentage I, I really like and I really feel good about. Not good like arrogant, but good like I'm contributing in a way that matches with how I feel called to contribute. There's some alignment there. The biblical and traditional rule of thumb for giving for ministry is 10%. If you are able to give 10% or more of your earnings to support the ministry, wonderful. For many of us, working incrementally on that percentage toward that higher percentage of giving is the attainable goal. Incremental growth also works in our prayer life as we learn to pray more and more, as we learn to trust more and more in God, Incremental growth works with whatever habits we know will lead us to live a more healthy life. However, we are called to learn how to love like Jesus loved incremental steps. We don't do it in one day. Now, God desires more than 10% of our hearts and our lives. God desires that everything we do and everything we are manifest in some way the goodness and love of God. God desires that when we pray and when we work and when we give and when we rest, 
that we direct the part of ourselves that is holy and sacred towards the goodness of God's world. I want to share an example of somebody who lives like that. As I was pondering this week an example of humility and wanting to learn about humility, and I looked for humility all around me, I found it. I found it. For 43 years, Doña Antonia has been cooking and serving food at El Hogar de Amor y Esperanza in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. I was there this week, and she had her mask on. Everybody wears masks in Honduras all the time, right now. And so as I received my plate of food, I saw these familiar eyes of Doña Antonia. Her first name is Antonia, and Doña means like respected lady, right? A, a woman of a certain age and, and place in the community. It's a, a term of honor and respect. So Doña Antonia's eyes. There she was, handing me my food. She's been there every time I've ever gone to El Hogar, at every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I don't know how she does it. Turns out she's been there for 43 years. I didn't realize that. Which is how long El Hogar has been there. She's been there the whole time. I did try to find out how old she was when she started. <laughs> because I can't believe she's served for 43 years. It's amazing. She's been there since North Americans saw a need, a need to take children who were living on the street, boys at that time, and take them off the street and house them and feed them and give them an education. The North Americans who were living and working in Honduras couldn't live with themselves. They couldn't take every child in, but they took in incrementally more and more children until it grew into multiple campuses and schools, and it grew beyond ninth grade, and then it supported young people who went off to college. And when those young people come back to El Hogar, who do they go looking for? Doña and Doña. They come back and show her their children and tell her what they are doing because she is the person who fed them meal by meal while they incrementally grew and learned and became faithful and productive citizens. She incrementally fed every hungry child before her without judgment for how well they're doing in their classes or how well they're behaving in the community. She just loved them. She loved them with rice and beans and eggs and tortillas and coffee because children drink coffee in Honduras, if you can believe it. She fed them with compassion and dignity and generosity and wisdom and hard work, really hard work. Her hands show it. Her hands show the work. One by one, those children, year after year, reached out their plate. And spoonful by spoonful, she fed them and watched them grow strong and capable. Through her actions, hope has become real, perceptible possible. There has been incremental and steady growth. Staff members and visiting groups and people like our congregation, we come and go with great celebration and people thank us and tell us how great it is that we came all the way down there and they praise us loudly as we gather and she just keeps serving up the days in the kitchen. There are many ways to offer ourselves and our actions to God, to experience the hope flowing forth from the spaciousness within us, where contempt and arrogance threaten to clog our growth. But we have a choice about that. We have a choice to make. We can choose the better way. We can choose humility and thanksgiving. We can choose to offer everything we have and everything we are to God, to God's use in this world. We can offer our wealth and our wisdom and our hard work, and in the process grow incrementally and sometimes dramatically more generous, more like Donia and Donia, more like God. Just as we can understand, that when one person does something harmful, it ripples out and harms all of humanity. Just as we understand that, it is also true 
that when one person acts with generosity, bears fruit that is good in the world, that ripples out and benefits all of humanity. There's power in our actions. The world improves with every beautiful action, every good action. It improves incrementally. And we move away from superiority and arrogance and contempt into generosity and compassion and hope. Donia Antonia is generous to the students, the staff, the visitors like us. With humility and generosity, her, end, her gentle eyes gaze on each hungry face as she dishes out the very best sustenance she can offer. Connection and grace and being valued and known, worth and dignity and hope. Let us follow her gaze, follow her humble leadership. Let us bring with us a gentle spirit as we serve in this world, as we serve other people. Let us be generous in ways that will incrementally transform our own lives and relationships and God's world. Amen.